Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, for the first time, a former head of state appears before a world court. Ex-Ivorian President Laurent Bagbo is in the dock in The Hague at the start of his long-awaited war crimes trial. Well, despite the allegations of atrocities, Bagbo continues to inspire the fierce loyalty of those who think he's been a scapegoat of the Ivory Coast's former colonial ruler, France. We meet some of his supporters gripped by the opening of the case. And for ladies only, the Imzad is a single stringed instrument played by exclusively Tuareg women in Algeria. We meet one teacher doing all she can to keep its sound alive. Well, on Thursday, former Ivorian leader Laurent Bagbo became the first ex-head of state to stand at the dock at the International Criminal Court. He's facing four war crimes and crimes against humanity charges at The Hague in connection to post-electoral violence that began in 2010, in which more than 3,000 people were killed. Bagbo has been jailed in the Netherlands since being extradited there in 2011. On Thursday, he denied all allegations against him. Monsieur Mr. Bagbo, do you plead guilty or not guilty? Thank you, Mr. President. I plead not guilty. Well, Bagbo continues to inspire the fierce loyalty of those who believe that he's been made a scapegoat for the political crisis that landed him in court. Dozens of his supporters gathered outside of the court ahead of the long-awaited trial and in Ivory Coast as well. Those convinced of his innocence were riveted to their TV screens as proceedings began. They've been waiting for this for five years. In their stronghold of Yopougon, these Bagbo supporters didn't want to miss the start of the trial. They believe in their leader's innocence. Do you know how this plot was hatched? Everyone knows Bagbo didn't do anything. He never killed anyone. You have hurt us for no reason. This is historic. His inner circle, the old guard and his son made the trip to watch the proceedings. I think we need truth and justice, and I believe we need Laurent Bagbo to be in Ivory Coast so that we can have lasting peace and a real start to the reconciliation process. The many victims of the post-electoral violence are also hoping for truth and justice. And for human rights organizations, this trial is just the beginning. This is just the first step. We have to go further. We have to get to the bottom of this so that the truth comes out and the victims can start healing. In Ivory Coast, for now, only those from Bagbo's camp have faced charges. But the Ivorian president and the ICC have promised there will be no impunity. Well, along with his former youth leader, Charles Blegude, Bagbo is accused of having orchestrated atrocities against their opponents after elections in 2010. Bagbo refused to concede defeat to his rival, current leader Alassane Ouattara. That prompted a violent deadlock. Rival armies turned Abidjan into a war zone. Until Ouattara's forces, backed by the UN and France, overran Bagbo's compound and arrested him and his wife in April 2011. On Thursday, the ICC's chief prosecutor painted a vivid picture of a man who would go to any lengths to hold on to power. Nothing would be allowed to defeat Mr. Bagbo. If politics failed, violence was seen as politics by other means. In claiming himself president of Cote d'Ivoire, Mr. Bagbo used the Ivorian Defense and Security Forces, the FDS, to attack civilians. He used mercenaries to attack civilians. He used youth groups and militia galvanized by the co-accused, Mr. Blegoudé, Mr. Blegoudé's hateful rhetoric to attack civilians. Well, our Luke Brown was in court at The Hague. The first day at this uh, landmark case at the International Criminal Court at The Hague, uh, really dominated by the prosecution as it uh, laid out its strategy and gave its 
best attempt to really make a strong impression uh, on the court itself. As the prosecution uh, detailed uh, the four charges of crimes against uh, humanity, it spoke of unspeakable violence. This is it accused uh, Lauren Bagbo and Charles Blay Goudet of really initiating a very well-defined plan to stay in power at any cost back in 2010-2011. And it's that talk of unspeakable violence that really uh, did cause uh, many, including the defendants, to sit up and take notice uh, in the court itself. And that's likely uh, to prove uh, perhaps uh, uh, an important kind of strategy adopted by the prosecution really five years on from the violence of uh, of the post-electoral crisis. It's that kind of language that's really uh, bringing uh, the, that violence back to, into everybody's uh, minds. Uh, of course, uh, the prosecution also laying out that it's uh, likely to have up to, up to and around 5,000 piece of, pieces of evidence uh, brought to the stand and 138 uh, witnesses are expected to testify uh, for the prosecution. Those include some uh, pretty major figures. It's thought from within the inner circle of the Lauren Bagbo uh, clan. Uh, so those are pretty important bits of evidence. Uh, it has to be said, though, of course, the uh, prosecution has been criticised by the court itself in preliminary hearings for having something of a, a lightweight uh, case. It's perhaps trying to uh, reverse that kind of impression uh, that uh, has been uh, the, one of the dominant factors of this uh, first uh, day. It is likely, though, to be uh, a pretty lengthy process with all that evidence, all those witnesses, uh, and, of course, the defence as well to give its side of the story. We're expecting this uh, case to last anything from between three uh, and five years. Luke Brown there for us in The Hague. In other news, Central African Republic has set the new date for its presidential runoff vote. That'll be on February 14th, Valentine's Day, the same day as the legislative poll. The crucial election had, to be, had been due to be held this Sunday, but was delayed because of logistical problems. Two former premiers, Aniset Dologele and Fusta Twadea, are vying for leadership of the strife-torn nation. Four Malian soldiers were killed on Thursday. Three died after their vehicle was hit by a landmine not far from the city of Gao. The fourth was shot dead in an ambush on the outskirts of Timbuktu. It's still not clear who was responsible. Large parts of the country remain lawless, despite a peace deal in June between Tuareg separatists and rival pro-government armed groups. New figures suggest that, for the first time in a decade, poaching of South Africa's rhinos is easing up. Now, it's home to about 80% of the world's populations, and the numbers of rhinos killed are still dangerously high. 1,175 were slaughtered in 2015, down 40 from the year before. The statistics are out as the Aquila Private Game Reserve takes on a new charge, a newborn calf found by anti-poaching rangers after having been abandoned by its mother. At under a month old, it represents a feature of a species for which survival is slowly trumping the odds. A single stringed violin played only by Tuareg women is making a comeback in Algeria. This as the last of its players come to the rescue of a tradition on the verge of extinction. This is the sound of the Imzad, a single chord violin played exclusively by Tuareg women in Algeria. According to an old belief, men risk a curse if they play it. The instrument has gone out of fashion among the young, so Khaulen Alamin has set herself the mission of reviving it. Young people are only interested in television and the telephone these days. When I was younger, I lived in the desert. We took the time to learn to play and enjoy the instrument. The instrument's discreet, refined lament traditionally accompanies poetic songs about the feats of past heroes. It was also played at courtship meetings, lasting long into the night. But by the early 2000s, only two women in Algeria still played the unique instrument. In 2003, Save the Imzad Association was launched, and now the instrument is even on the UNESCO Cultural Heritage List. The association boasts a recording studio, a dance studio, a stage for performances, and a workshop for making imzads. When I first arrived here, I met a woman called Sept, who used to make imzads before I did. I watched what she was doing very carefully until I started to make them myself. The dried-out half of a calabash shell is sometimes even picked from the centre's own garden. The work here ensuring the music of the Algerian desert will stand the test of time. Well, that's it for Iron Africa. Stay with us. More coming up.
exclusive. France Van Cat welcomes Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. On his first official visit to France, he will discuss major issues in international affairs, including the lifting of sanctions on Iran, his country's return to the international scene, the chilling relations with Saudi Arabia, and the fight against terrorism. Don't miss this exclusive interview on France 24 and France24.com. Revisited. Situated at 1,700 meters and overlooking a lake, Srinagar is the jewel in the crown of Kashmiri tourism. But in 1989, a separatist revolt backed by neighboring Pakistan swept the predominantly Muslim region. India declared a state of emergency. Tourism collapsed. 25 years after the most violent period in their history, Kashmiris want to believe in a peaceful future. But tension is still there. Imams continue to fill local mosques with calls for Kashmir's independence. Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.